Greetings everyone, I'm Jack and welcome to TARDIS Central. Big Doctor Who news today. Bella Whovians, as last week, end of a BFI screening of a Peter Cushing films. And a surprising revelation. The rediscovery of an unmade movie script nearly four decades after it was written. It's time to delve into this most exciting news. Like always, if you want to keep up to date on the latest Doctor Who news, lore and more, then make sure to hit that subscribe button to never, and I stress never, miss a video from the team here at Tide Essential. You can also follow us on social media for daily updates on the Doctor Who universe. Now as always, please let us know your thoughts in the comment section below, because if you're talking about Doctor Who, then of course we want to hear about it. So, let's talk more. Yes, it's true. An unmade Doctor Who movie script has indeed been discovered and unveiled to the world this past week. Just what exactly is it? Well first, we need to talk a little bit about Milton Sabotsky. Having acted as a scriptwriter, half a film production duo of Max J. Rosenberg, since the mid-1950s, the two set their sights quickly upon Doctor Who, in the sudden success of its second story, The Mutants. Since commonly referred to by fans as the Daleks, or the Dead Planet, to avoid confusion in the later third Doctor story. Under their partnership, the two had formed the company Armicus Productions, at the start of 1961, and rapidly became involved in the production of the horror films, much like the company Hammer Studios. Their eyes had just turned to Doc 2, following their work on the Doctor Terror's House of Horrors. Amicus set off into the universe, ultimately securing the rights to the first film, Doctor Who and the Daleks, and later after success, a second one entitled The Daleks Invasion Earth 2150 AD. Who remembers that one? The second film, however, did not perform as well as hoped, and so the third one was never made. Milton Sabosky's short but memorable tenure as a writer of Doc 2, albeit in an adaptation, came to an end in 1966, which is what makes this recovered script so notable. Doc 2's greatest adventure, unveiled at the BFI by Milton's sons Sergei and Dimitri, would have seen Sabotsky return to the universe for yet another film in 1985, this time swapping out Peter Cushing as the Doctor and the Daleks, as a menace to be four. The two brand new Doctors, one young and one old, Facing off a group of giant crabs that had come to terrorise a seaside town. Anybody else thinking the macro? Just me? Okay, sure. To make it clear, and despite the uncertainty of the Radio Times in covering this in their recent article, there was no intention of Cushing ever being considered for a return, and it's unlikely Curzon or Toby were either if he wasn't. This was known because we have Sabotsky's own words to go on for this. In a comprehensive interview with Tim Burchell for Dreamwatch Bulls in the September 1990 issue, that's issue 81 of the original run, for those keeping track by the way, Zbogotsi had in fact mentioned the proposed third script he had written. Saying of it, it's got two doctors in it, one old and one younger one. I'd use John Petrie or Tom Baker for the older doctor. Now it should also not be confused with the brief consideration that Amicus had in the 1960s, before potentially making an adaptation of The Keys of Monicus or The Chase. Both of our ideas were not developed into any definitive plans or documents. Nor should it be confused with A Mission of Doom, a fan film featuring model work by Julian Vince. It's somewhat mistaken for a third Cushing movie occasionally. Vince said would have been centred around Paul Tams as the Doctor, fighting against mechanoids and the Daleks of a first Cushing movie design, and we love those by the way. Now, contrary to Big Finish's recent tweet describing as a third Dalek film, the source of menace of the script would solely have been The Crabs. Which leads us to an interesting bit of discussion. Why does the Bogotsi go for giant crabs? Well, you might be tempted to think he was riffing on the Macra, massive multiple crab-like creatures that had appeared in the second Doctor Who story, The Macra Terror, all the way back in the 1967 years. But actually, this script had more of a recent source of inspiration. Enter Knights of the Crabs by Guy N. Smith, released in 1976. The novel centered around a botany professor, Cliff Davenport, and his mission to defeat a horde of giant crabs who are invading the Welsh seaside town of Labandadir. Yeah. Honestly, on my script, this is good luck, there's no pronunciation for that. Thanks, Jamie, for writing that. If you can pronounce that, tweet it to me. Do your best impression. Labandadir. Laban. I don't know. Do you want to move up? Skip, cut, go. Land better. Sunbed. Sunbed. Certainly, in a way that would amuse some classic Whovians, by coincidence, this story opens with Cliff's nephew called Ian Wright, and features Cliff calling the hotel owner Mrs. Jones' mum. Ian, Wright, and almost have Cliff Jones, if only there's a Ben or Polly. Popular enough in the so-called horror pop fiction space, the book then spawned an entire series of sequels, and somewhere along the line, the book came to the attention of Sabotsky. 
According to Sergei and Dmitri, their father then set about writing a script adaptation of Night of the Crabs, sometime in the early 1980s. When this project didn't come to be, Zabrotsky then began to rework the initial script and its idea into a completely new story, a Doctor Who one. The result made a number of changes, including reworking the heroic stand and the action made in order to accommodate two Doctors, or Doctor Whos, as they likely would have been known. And relocated the action from Land Better near Wales to the seaside town of Leosmouth in Scotland. Lossiemouth in Scotland? I don't know. Lossiemouth. Thus, the result was initially entitled the Lossiemouth Affair. I'm saying it like that now, alright? It's impossible to tell why the relocation was made. Perhaps Zagotsi felt Scotland, I'm just saying that, would be an easy location to replicate in terms of filming, or that aiming for a Scottish setting might be generally more appealing to a wider audience. Whatever the reason, it changed. Now, it's worth saying at this point that the Lossiemouth Affair, or Doctor Who's Greatest Adventure as later tiled, certainly must have been drastically different, not just in how the cards would have been changed and the setting, but also on a wider scale. Different as a family film compared to the original planned Night of the Crab script. This novel was notably graphic in its depiction of violence and gory demises, and even includes some, shall we say, intimate scenes. You know what I mean. Certainly no Doctor Who film would have gone in that sort of direction, for obvious reasons. As Charles Norton detailed in the book, now on the big screen in 2013, Zagrotsi had completed this brand new reworking of the script as a Doctor Who story by September 1984, and had approached BBC Enterprises, very roughly speaking the 1980s version of the BBC Studios and BBC Worldwide. Essentially, he went about producing a film, presumably under his late 1970s and early 1980s company of Sword and Sorcery Productions, or name. And by then, Amex Productions had long since been shuttered. Most of Gotsi was hoping for a start in production around February 1985. The BBC decided against granting him the rights to produce a new film. It is worth saying that as an aside, unlike in the mid 1960s, there was a number of companies competing to get production started on such a film in the 80s. Less than a year after his interview with Dreamwatch Bulletin on June 27th of 1991, Milton Spagotsi passed away, and so it seemed the script was forever lost to time with him. When Norton approached Milton's widow, Fiona, in 2013, she said that Milton basically didn't keep things in terms of memorabilia. We've got practically nothing. It's quite extraordinary. That was the approach to life. Doctor Who archive historian Richard Bignall had also in his own research into the matter been told this by her some years ago, but nothing survived of the script. Yet, amazingly, now, nearly a decade after those inquiries by Norton and Bignall, and nearly four decades after it was written, Sirk and Dimitri have revealed to the world a wonderful treat in its survival. A multi-doctor adventure on the big screen, written by the man who first took the Hooniverse there. Epic, right? We reached out to the Spogotsi family to ask for further details about this sudden recovery, and we should update you on whether we receive any further information. In the meantime, this most exciting news leaves a lot of thoughts. Will Big Finish be able to negotiate some form of adapting to this audio, perhaps? Featuring two new Doctors? Will the since reformed Amicus instead create it in some new form with another company? Will Richard Bignall be able to publish the scripts instead, as he's been able to do in some instance before? Who knows? I don't know. Honestly, let us know what you think in the comments. And also, do let us know who you think could have played the younger Doctor alongside John Pertwee or Tom Baker's older Doctor. So, that's it for myself today on TARDIS Central. Again, let us know what you think. Massive thanks to Paul M. Tams, Tim Birchall, Charles Norton, Richard Bignall, and the Spogotsi family, without whom this particular video wouldn't have quite been insightful as it is. Like always, if you want to keep up to date on the latest Doc 2 news, lore, and more, then make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss a video from the team here at TARDIS Central. You can, of course, also follow us on social media for daily updates on the Doc 2 universe. But for now, I've been Jack, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.